and we need more men in there. We need more men. And so if you're not doing anything else, then you can join in prayer ministry at the minimum and be a part of something happening. And I, I promise you don't want to just come to church and not serve and be a part. You want to be involved. You really do. The Spirit of God in you wants you to be involved. So give into that voice and be involved somewhere. That's very important. Thank you so much. Great things happening on the calendar. I'm excited. I wanted to make a lot of jokes about them as they popped up, like the murder mystery. It was Judas. I already know the answer. And then, um, and then our crawfish dinner is on April Fool's, so you don't even know if we're actually having one or not. It's funny. You're going to get here and no one's going to be here. April Fool's. So that'll be fun to see who actually signs up for that on April Fool's. Looking forward to that. Uh, all right, God bless you. You can be seated tonight. I'm just glad you're all here. Thank you, musicians, for a great job as singers, for leading us into worship. Great atmosphere tonight. I'm going to do a little bit of pastoring. I, I actually allow this to be on, on public Facebook tonight and on YouTube um, I have found that there are some people in our area, or maybe even people not in our area, that they, they wish that they could hear our Wednesday night services. In fact, I get people a lot trying to connect to our Facebook group, and they're not allowed to come in because our Facebook group is called For Members Only, and people don't know what that means. So uh, people try to join our Facebook group For Members Only that are not members, but uh, a lot of the information that we deal with in that group is, is pretty private. And so people wish they could belong and fit, but they can't, and they miss our Wednesday night services. Uh, so sometimes I feel like it's good to put them online. It could, be, it could be a benefit to people. Sometimes I don't think it's really for anybody but us. But tonight I will allow it to be online, and I hope this is a blessing to people who are not members of our church, people watching online. Maybe this can be an impact. There are ministers um, out there that are alone, and they're ministering, they're pastoring, and they like to have a different view sometimes. And as a pastor, I can be a blessing to some of them who I know would uh, probably like to have, especially tonight's topic. Um, so tonight's topic is, um, are Christians allowed to punish others? Are Christians allowed to punish others? That might not be the best word to use, but it sure stands out from all the other words. And to me, it probably is the same thing. While you might not say you punish people, when they do you wrong, you let them have it. Now, you might not call it punish, but it sure seems like it. You treat me wrong, I'll, you're going to pay for it. That's called punishment, y'all. Maybe you're not the parent on the kid, but we do punish people. We, with your cold attitude, you punish people. You let people have it all the time. In your own marriage, you let them have it. Are oh, you going to talk to me that way? Fine. Watch what happens. I won't talk to you the rest of the night. That's called a punishment. Now, you call it what you want to call it. You can sound spiritual. I rebuke them with a chaste heart. and You can use King James Version, but the truth is when we're done wrong as Christians, we don't quite know what to do. Are we, are we supposed to just sit there and take it? Are we supposed to leave them? Because that's a punishment too. You can't hang out with me. So what do we do as Christians? Do we always just sit there and just take it? Do we keep ourselves around abusive people because we love them? How do we respond in this crazy world we're living in when, it, when we really feel like letting people have it for what they do to us? And I just thought it would be a great topic. Are Christians allowed to punish others? Or should we just let things go, ignore it, and move on? So let me just dive into it tonight. Uh, I, I don't know how it will go. Let me just share what's on my heart tonight. And hopefully I can be a blessing if you're, if you're a child tonight. Try to listen the best you can. Youth, listen the best you can. Because this topic has a lot to do with kids and youth because you don't think you should be punished. We are living in an era that is softer on crime than probably ever that I can, I can see in history. And it's not because we love people more. That's not the truth at all. If we don't love people more and we're softer on crime, why are we softer on crime? It's politically motivated, 100%. It's politically motivated. Soft on crime is one of the parties, the main party's agenda. Hard on crime is one of the other political parties' agenda. It's a political talking point. 
We are softer on evil people today than ever before. It's a true fact. Teachers are quitting the public school districts because children are straight crazy. Because parents don't discipline their kids anymore and they're not afraid. It's a massive problem in our society, this soft on crime problem. We have more laws today than ever, but we've legalized more evil. We have tons of laws, but our laws have actually made it easier for evil people to be evil. If anybody is oppressed, there are more anti-Christian laws now in the books than ever. There is no more fear of consequences from the legal system anymore. Just this past week, released on Twitter... Right there in the daylight of, I guess, Chicago, they can't seem to fix their crime problems. Uh, a man shot another man, homeless man, in the head, right there, videoed by somebody else and executed him. And it's going viral. He literally casually reloaded his gun in, daylight, in the daylight on the side of a street. And it took him about a minute to do it before he pointed out the homeless guy and shot him in the head. Nike could care less about going to jail. They caught him. They're going to prosecute him. He's got mental issues probably, right? That's what they say now. And that's the world that we live in. There's no fear of consequence. There's no fear of getting in trouble. They're not, they didn't learn it when they were children that you, it hurts when you do bad things. They didn't learn that. So now they've got to go spend the rest of their life in jail or get, or get death row. Because he didn't learn it when they were young. Because nobody did it to him. Uh, nobody spanked him, and so now they have to be tased. No one tased them, now they've got to be jailed. No one jailed them, now they've got to be killed. It just progressively gets worse when there are no consequences to bad choices. I wish that just loving the world would make everyone stop. But that's not how it works. Love does not make everyone change. It doesn't make everyone change. You can love people, they'll still kill you. You can love people, they'll still steal from you. Love is just the best way to change lives. It's not a guarantee. Yep. There are less police that want to get in the middle of the messes these days in our society. You ever notice that? Why would they want to lose their job? Why would they want to get killed? Why would they want to go save someone's life just to get the liberal media, put them on the, on the news at 10 o'clock at night saying this is a trash police officer? Our police are not getting involved like they used to. It's too many lawsuits. Too much can happen wrong. So even the few police we have left, they don't want to come get involved. Can you blame them? So we have more and more evil being free in our world and more and more fear in our world. There's probably never been a scarier time to be in this world than right now. Our kids and our youth are more unruly than ever before in our society. And some of you don't think that's true, but just take away their Xbox. A devil will come out. Tell them they can't date them. I dare you. Tell them they can't date them anymore. Tell them they got to break up with them. I dare you. Watch little angel turn into a devil. And if you really brave parents, take away their phone. I dare you. That's like their social hub connection to their friends. Now, you might as well say you can't have a friend when you take away somebody's phone these days. You might as well just take away the friends. Because that's the only way they know how to communicate. It's through their phone. We have beliefs that we know in the church to be true. Do you have beliefs like that? Anybody have beliefs that you believe are worth dying over? That's probably part of the problem. Does anybody have beliefs you call true, black and white? 
Anybody have certain truths you believe to be true in your life? Okay. So after studying the Bible, we know what's right and what's wrong. Amen? We know what's right and what's wrong in the eyes of, of Jesus. We know what's right and what's wrong. Not everything, but we know a lot about what's right and what is wrong. And the question is, should we ever get involved in each other's sins and wrongdoings? Or should we turn a blind eye? That's the big question. How do we continue to maintain relationships with each other when we disagree all the time? You know why people ignore you? Because they don't want to fight you. You know how people are walking down the hall and they take a quick right? They don't want to deal with you. You're too much. If you feel like people avoid you, it's because you're difficult. People scare to you. That's the truth. People avoid you because you're drama. People avoid you because you don't have peace whenever you hang out with you. Because people don't want to fight anymore. They have to fight every day. And they're sick of fighting people. They're sick of not trusting people. What do they do? They avoid you. That's what they do. You know why we avoid each other? Because we haven't learned to talk to each other and work through problems. We just avoid each other. We just move, divorce, and change churches. We just quit because we don't know how to love each other enough to sit down and look each other in the eye and work through our problems. We just run from our problems. It's so sad. When I say the word punish, I'm asking, should we ever make somebody suffer for what they've done wrong? Are we supposed, or we know we're supposed to love people. Are we ever allowed to do anything that would cause pain for another as a parent, as a leader, or even as a Christian? Is it permissible? Is it allowed? Is it wrong for us to be the cause that somebody would have to hurt if we're a loving Christian? Ever? Is it, is it ever? That's the question tonight. And I think we need to be free to know the truth. Let me start by asking this question to answer that question. Should we turn a blind eye? That's our question. Anybody in here think that we need to keep the jails and the prisons operating for certain crimes? Raise your hand. For certain crimes, do you think we should have jails and prisons in our system? Y'all a bunch of evil people. Let me get this right. You're okay locking somebody up the rest of their life to stare in a little bitty cube room in a bar and eat trash food the rest of their life? You're okay with that? Do you know why you're okay with that? Because some folks can't be reasoned with. Some folks can't be loved out of it. Some folks, you just can't talk right to them. You can't give them enough money. You can't give them enough opportunity. They've taught us the only thing that will keep them from hurting people is locking them up. It's sad, but it's true. It's sad, but it's true. And we're not talking about everybody. And, and tonight, we are not talking about everybody anytime. There's always other ways around everything I'm teaching. I'm talking about as a general rule. We as Christians love God and we love people, but we realize that there should be consequences. Is that what you think? You know what's funny? Almost everyone in the world believes there should be consequences to evil, except they don't get what people go to hell over. That's hypocritical. If you believe in jail, you believe in hell. It's a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite for saying that people should not go to hell because it's a punishment when you believe in punishment. Either you believe that wrong gets wrong or you don't. You can't have it both ways. If you believe that people that kill people should have some time to learn their lesson in jail, then you believe that there is a time for hell. You do. Be consistent throughout your belief systems. Do it. So let's look at some truths about, about us before we answer this question completely. First, number one, our God is a God of order. Everybody say order. order. Everybody say order. order. Young people say order. order. Good job. Those of you that think you're young, you can say it too. Young at heart. From the beginning, there were borders, there were guidelines, there were expectations in the Bible, even forbidden acts. From day one, even in paradise, there was order. God said, Adam, you're this, you're a man, 
Woman, Eve, you're a woman. There's order. This is what you'll do every day. This is why I made you. This is what you won't do. In the very beginning, God said the only way we will coexist is if there is order and punishments. It's that simple. If you like your life in paradise, do not be selfish and go against me. If you want to end all this, eat what you want to eat, and you will suffer the consequences. Y'all, that's how this works. There's no other way around it. I know I don't like to see people suffer either, but people have got to make their own mind up. I wish I could go downtown and stop all the homelessness, but I'm convinced half of them are okay. They're happy out there. Some of them look happy. I don't think they want to leave. I know you can't understand that, but it's just the way they think, some of them. Paul told the church in 1 Corinthians, get, your, get, get ready for a lot of Bible tonight. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 14, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Should I keep reading? You sure? Are you sure you want to go to the next one? All right, you said it. Let's go to the next one. Let your women keep silent in the churches. Y'all want to go back now? <laughs> Here's what we do. We skip over scriptures we don't like and hope we don't ever have to figure out what they really mean. Because if we really find out what they mean, we may have to live by them. We would rather be ignorant and study. Let your women keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak but, but are to be submissive as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home for it is shameful for women to speak in the church. Now women, if you're married today and you want to understand that scripture, when you get home, ask your husbands. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. It's a joke. I know. That's mean. I know. <laughs> Oh, man. You know why I'm laughing about that scripture? Because it's not as scary as women think it is. It's really not that scary. This, this scripture, when studied in context with the entire chapter, is not scary at all. Look at how it leads. God is not the author of confusion. God's the author of order and peace. This is not saying that women can't verbalize things in a congregation. This is saying that if you have headship in your life, then you need to go through the chain of command. You need to go through the one you said you were submitted to. That's all it means. It means when it comes to something confusing, when it comes to something off and you don't understand something, then don't just blurt out, but go through the proper flow of submission to get the answer that you're looking for. Apparently, the church was having a tough time with women not dealing with their own husbands. Maybe they were having a problem with husbands not being men of God. Because I would hate for the women to say, Pastor, I'd love to ask my husband when I get home what the Bible says, but he's on Xbox. So I'll talk to you instead, Pastor. Maybe the problem with the women in the church wasn't the problem with the women. Maybe the problem was the men didn't know the answers for the women's questions, so they had to come to church and raise their voice up and ask the pastor because the men weren't the pastors of their homes. We don't know why it's there. We just know it's there. In order for this scripture to be fulfilled, husbands must be able to answer their wives and not feel threatened by them. When they question them. Now why am, I, why am I even bringing that one up? I'm not trying to mess with you tonight. Okay? I'm trying to show you that in the scripture, God wants there to be order and not chaos. Our God does not want us to just to do what we want, say what we want, when we want. This, this entire theme of Corinthians, it talks about a church that's out of control. A bunch of spirit-filled people with wildfire that don't know how to have order in their lives. They just free and just running around and just filling the spirit, but no order. They were hurting each other because they were immature Christians with no order, no oversight, no authority, no, no 
figure in the church of leadership. So Paul wrote the letter of Corinthians and said, everything, verse 40, 14 and 40, pull it up. Let all things be done decently and in order. If you want to summarize Corinthians, it's let all things be done in the church decently and in order. We are not crazy people. We are flowing in the spirit of God. We're the people of peace and joy. We are not wild people. We're not wild people. We have control. No, 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 Paul's not trying to tell women they can't speak in church. It's about women not having a relationship with their husbands that is spiritual and godly and pure. Our God does not just shoot from the hip, church family. He doesn't just do stuff off of a whim. It might seem like it to you, but he, he, he pre-plans everything he does. Nothing catches my God off guard. Nothing does. He does not shoot from the hip, but he aims at things. He's got a goal and an agenda that's been there from day one. Everything that our God God does is through order. Nothing catches him off guard. Nothing surprises him. The cancer report you just got did not shock him. He already has a solution for what you've received. Our God has a perfect plan for us. He does not shoot from the hip. And neither should we. We're the people of God. We're organized, not because we're afraid and because we're cold and because we're a machine. We're organized because we are in submission. There's order in the church because of our submission, not because of our ignorance, not because we're fearful. We don't make a bunch of schedules because we're we're, we're not spirit-led. We make schedules to just be the bones and the rafters of the building, but then we turn the air on and we work within the confines of what God has given us to work in. God works inside of submission. God flows inside of order. God moves inside of a certain plan. Our God is not a God of confusion. Where there's confusion, I'm telling you, that is the work of the devil. And if you've ever said this in church, I'm confused. That's not the will of God. Because our God is a God of order. Now, our church has a structural system to go by, and that's totally okay. Every peaceable human organization on earth has a disciplinary action to maintain peace and order. Every single one. Every business that claims to love people and they spend thousands of millions of dollars every year to prove they love people will fire you if you show up late too much. Talk about how you love people. They'll fire you in a heartbeat. You find me any corporation you think is doing the most good for the world and you don't show up enough days in a row, they'll fire you and you'll be out in the street. Talk about how people love people. It don't matter how much you love people, there's still consequences. It's foolish for us to say there should never be consequences. Yes, there should. That's how you learn. That's how you stop. Every religion that seems successful has consequences to not obeying the teachings of that religion. Some go pretty extreme. Cut your hand off, kill you, which you, you're, I guess you can't obey if you're dead, but you definitely won't mess up again. Every church in Christian denomination, no matter how, how beautiful you think the church is online, every single one of them have rules that they go by. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. You may say there's a church down the road that has so much liberty and freedom. I, I promise you, you can't just wear whatever you want singing on their platform. Promise you. We're not there yet. We're almost there. But we're not there yet. I'm telling you, every organization that lasts, that stands, has consequences to doing wrong. Every one. Every one. Every business. Everything working in the world that works, there are consequences to not doing it right. And that's the way the world works. And that has to be the case. Because when we let everything go, it's chaos. It's chaos. It's a different kind of suffering. Look, there's going to be suffering no matter what. There's going to be suffering up front. Or suffering in the end. That's how it works. Either you learn the lesson when you're young or you will take a bigger dose of hurt when you're old. But you will get hurt. Young people hear me. Everyone hear me tonight. You will suffer if you don't obey. 
you will be hurting if you don't obey. You will face consequences if you don't obey. It's the way of this world. It's the way of the kingdom of God. It's the law of God. This is how it works. It's like gravity. Nothing good happens when you are disobedient and you go against the laws of God. You can't change it. You can't force it. All you can do is maybe have a good life, but then there will be hell. You cannot escape this law, church family. Learn it right now. If you're young, listen closely. If you want to be miserable the rest of your life, then ignore this, this man of God tonight. But I'm telling you, learn it early. There are consequences to not doing what is right. The majority of things that we counsel and deal with in the church are from bad decisions. Either you made or someone else made for you. And you're still paying the price for them today. Even some atheists believe in laws and are happy to see us locked up for breaking the laws that they approve of. It's not just a God thing. No. If you're getting tired tonight, every now and then just say, amen, even if you don't like it, it'll wake you up. (laughs) Secondly, the body of Christ is easily affected by its members. So let's clear this up right now. The reason why we have to answer this question is because we don't realize how it damages other people among us when we're not living right. You can't do what you want to do just because you're an individual. You are not an individual if you share the same spirit that I have. You're not anymore. You're not anymore. You hear that? Do you have the Holy Ghost? So do I. We're brothers and sisters. We're in the same family of God, and you can't do whatever you want. You are not an island to yourself. You are not free to do what you want to do. When you signed up and took the blood of Jesus on you, you became a part of me, and I'm a part of you, and now you do not have rights over your own body, over your own mind, over your own spirit. You can't do what you want to do and be in this kingdom. You've got to leave it to do what you want to do. We have tried real hard in churches across America to make sure everybody is sweet to everybody else. But you can only go so far with that. It matters how you act if you're my brother and sister. And I do not have to be quiet and still, I can still love you and speak up. Because what you permit in your life can bring me down or lift me up. And I do not have to sit here in a church with people who share my spirit and endure your agitation to bring me down and make me go to hell, I get to speak up. I get to say, no, no, no. I get to say, that ain't right, brother, and that ain't right, sister. If you're going to be in this kingdom and this church, I'm going to at least speak up and tell you, that's not right. And that's a consequence to living unrighteous among the righteous. I don't like that. A part of you won't like it. Your flesh can't stand it. But it's what you need to hear. A lot of people go, they leave a church like ours and they find a more loving church. No, what that means is a more permissive church. Where they can get away with things and not get called out as much. That is the best church for you if that's what you want. Because all I'm going to do is hurt your feelings if you stay here. But that's not best for you. Because if you're going to make it to heaven, it's going to be because you got everything going for you. Because you got every word of warning. You got everything in your face saying, go this way and not that way. We need everything we can get our hands on to make it in this crazy world we're living in. Everything's trying to take us to hell. Everything's trying to bring us down. Everything's trying to destroy our families. We cannot sit back and be content. We have got to fight back. And I want warriors around me in the last days. I want strong people around me in the last days. I want fighters around me in the last days. I want my family surrounded by people of faith with conviction people that stand on the word of God and don't budge loyal people I want to go to a church with loyal people who are ready to do whatever it takes to have revival that's what I want around me I don't want to be afraid I'm thankful for people like that in my life so so it matters what you do in the church and it's a lie that says you can do whatever you want you're free no you're not Not whenever you're born again in water of the Spirit. You're not free anymore. 
Ephesians 4 and 1, Paul said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Everybody say in love. Love, love is the root of everything we do. Yeah. There's never a consequence. We don't filter through love, ever. Yeah. We never do anything except through love. If I stand up and disagree with you, it's through love. If I take you off this platform because you're living in sin, it's because I love you. And I love this people and I love this God. Everything we do is rooted in love or we should not do it. Actually, we still have to do it, but we got to make sure we have love right. Love is the foundation we do everything on. Because if we do it through love, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's not easy to keep peace. It's not easy to keep unity. I've got to endeavor to do it. Some folks push me to the edge. But I've got to endeavor to hold this thing together. It's not natural to do it. Keep, let's keep going. Verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in, in, in one hope of your calling. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Y'all, we are connected through God's spirit, uh, through his death on the cross. Uh, we are family. We are brothers and sisters. Uh, and it matters what you do. You're not just taking yourself down. You're taking others down with you. A little leaven leavens a whole lump, church family. A little bit gets in there and starts to mold and spread. And that's why you can't even let a little come in the kingdom of God. When you let that happen, it'll hurt innocent people. But when it comes to you destroying other people, you need to go somewhere else. Because there's too many innocent, sweet people around here that are trying to fight hell and high water to stay living for God. And the last thing they need is someone in the church that calls himself a brother and a sister to be always fighting them and bringing them down. We're connected, church family. And what happens to you will affect me indirectly. And it's because we're, uh, we're connected. We have a voice in each other's lives. Yes, we do. Amen. And if you don't like people talking to you about your walk with God, then you're not really in the church. This is the whole purpose of it. Romans 12 and 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It hurts me when you hurt. I'm happy when you're happy. It affects us, church family. You walking around sour all the time saying you have the Holy Ghost hurts us. Pray through, get help, get counseling, whatever it takes, figure it out. Because if you are a long-standing member in the kingdom and you claim to be saved, but you walk around just destroying folks all the time because you have no joy, you've got to fix it quickly because you can bring others down. You don't realize how powerful you are when you belong to the body. You can anchor people away from Jesus. If we're all weeping, they're all weeping. If we're rejoicing, we're rejoicing. It grows in the kingdom. Whatever is happening happens more. If you're all sad, we get sad. But if somebody says, I'm about to get happy, I'm about to rejoice, I'm about to testify, that it begins to become contagious in the church because I feel what you feel and you feel what I feel. We are together in this thing. Verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Everybody say, if it's possible. That means sometimes it's not. Well, as Christians, we just have to take everything. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a line. There's a line. Some things aren't possible. Some things I've given everything I can give to make it work, and it's not possible. Some things I feel like I've got nothing left, Jesus. I've tried to work it out with them, but they have given me no other option. It is no longer possible. As much as depends on my human ability, I can only do so much, Jesus, uh, to be peaceably with all men. There comes a time when you've just got to cut it out. And the devil will come and tell you that you don't love him. And it's a lie. Yeah. Hear that denominal Christian world? It's a lie. Do you know why now there's homosexual preachers? 
Because you got to love them or they'll be lost. No. You, sir, are perverted. You're wrong. And if you don't repent, you will go to hell. That's love. I'm telling you something that can save you. I'm telling you something that can get you right. You're deceived. You don't even realize how messed up you are. But I'm telling you to wake up. Everybody else is just giving you a pulpit. I'm telling you, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You've got to get right. That's the definition of love. Look, if it's possible, as much as depends on you, do your best to have peace with all men. But if it's not possible, do your best. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, verse 19, but rather, give, but rather give place to wrath. That means make some space, make sure that no wrath shows up. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I'll repay. Make a space for God to have vengeance in your situation. Leave a gap for God to work is what the Bible's saying. Make space so you won't take that space and you won't get even with people. Leave some room for God to get even with you. Leave some room for God to be the judge. Leave some room for God to take over problems you can't fix. Leave some room in your life when you feel like getting even and you feel like getting somebody back. The Bible says leave some room because the Lord will avenge everything that comes against us. The Lord will fix everything you don't fix. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Verse 20, therefore, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. You know, the best attack you can use against the enemy is love. Because you ain't never going to help your enemy by shooting back at them. Cussing them back out and and, and getting revenge. All that does is empower your enemy. You want to justify your enemies? Fight them just like they fight you. Because then they'll feel justified doing it. The only way to convert an enemy is through love. Trying your best to be at peace with them and not have vengeance against them. But there comes a point when you can only do so much and you've got to cut it out of your life. The context in Romans 12 technically is how to treat our enemies, not our church brothers and sisters. I know it's kind of all together because some of you have got enemies in the church. But technically it's talking about people trying to hurt you. Notice the balance between not letting hate get inside of us and knowing when my situation is past the possible line that I can no longer fix this, I've got to avoid you. There are times in our lives as Christians when the punishment, the consequence, is I can no longer be around you anymore. And that is absolutely biblical. There are some people we are not to be around anymore. It's not wrong, it's not evil, we do love them. But it's just not possible anymore. And it hurts you. And you wish you could help them, but they won't listen. They haven't listened. You've tried. Time's up. It's not possible. Not for me. Only God. Our enemies cannot be judged by us because they do not see us as an authority in their lives. When you bow up on your enemies, they don't care about you. You ever notice that? Well, you listen here, Buster. I'm going to tell you, um, you better listen to me. Your enemies don't love you, they don't like you, they don't respect you, they don't care about you. You have no authority over your enemies. Guess what authority you have over? Only in the kingdom of God. You cannot take authority over flesh out in that world. They don't care about you. They don't care about your big Bible. They don't care about how you sing on the platform. They don't care about how many, how many angels you've seen. They don't care. They are called your enemies for a reason. They want to destroy you. But Christians walk around like, I got the authority. I got the name in this kingdom. I mean, you can be the choir director up in here and somebody might listen to you, but out there, you're just somebody. You're just another body. Don't you know who I am? I'm a chosen vessel. You can use your King James Version language on the world. They don't care. You may have power over the spirit, the enemy, but you don't have power over the people. They don't care nothing about you. We go around trying to have authority on people and tell them stuff and straighten them out and give them scriptures. They don't care. You're wasting your time. Now, on this whole judging thing, 
We know through the scriptures that we are allowed to judge situations, but we know through the scripture we are not allowed to judge salvations. We can judge situations, but not salvations. When most people in our world say, don't judge me, what they're saying is don't tell me whether I'm going to go to hell or not. We don't have that power. We never have had that power. We're letting them twist it. When I tell you that you're living in sin, I'm using the scripture to go by and the fruit of your life. I'm not telling you you're going to go to hell because you could repent tomorrow. How could I possibly say that, right? So I am not judging people by telling them they're going to hell just because I disagree with their lifestyle. They will tell us when I disagree with their lifestyle that I am judging them. I am not judging them because I am not the judge. I do not have authority over your salvation. Nobody in the earth has authority over someone else's salvation. Nobody. Not your mom, not your dad, not your grandpa, not a preacher, not a pastor. Nobody has authority to put you in heaven or hell except Jesus Christ. He is the only eternal judge, the only one. So when we say judgment, we're saying making a judgment call about the situation you're in. And the church has the ability to judge. Yes, we do. Jesus taught, judge others and they will use what you judged on them against you. Everybody clap your hands one time. Just trying to wake you up. If you go around judging your brother, guess what they're going to do the next time? If you say, hey, what you eating Cheetos for again and you got a big bag of Doritos, what you use to measure them, they'll use to measure right back on you. So Jesus taught this. He said, if you want to help your brother, get rid of your own Cheetos. Get rid of the Cheeto dust in your eye so you can get rid of the potato chip in their eye. That's the modern, modern, modern day version. Jesus did not say you can't judge whether your brother or sister is wrong or right. He said you can't do it and still be wrong yourself. He said the only way for you to help your brother is to look at what they're doing wrong and make sure you're not doing it wrong. So if you see them doing something wrong, the first thing you do is not go tell your brother they're wrong. You go look in the mirror and say, am I wrong? Because if I can get right and conquer what they're battling, I can go help them deliver what they're facing. Jesus did not say, I cannot judge things. He said, be careful doing it because you could be a hypocrite. We need people to judge. Oh, yes, we do. Everybody, there's some people deceived these days. We need to wake up. We need people to tell us. We're going to see later more about that, but let's look at some examples of Christians giving some consequences or getting consequences, giving and getting Number one, our children. Everybody say our children. In our culture, we would consider this to be up to the age of 18. That's probably debatable, but we would call them minors, up to 17, minors. Ephesians 6 and 1, put it up there. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Echo to get in Colossians 3 and 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Then take it back to the Old Testament. Proverbs 13, 24, he who spares his rod hates his son. Anybody hate your son? That's good, brother. Thank you for not hating your son. I'll need to see you in the office at the church figuring out how you got one, though, because that's, that's concerning. You're like seven. He who spares his rod hates his son. Anybody here hate your son? No, but where's your rod? Because the definition of hating your son is that you don't discipline your children. Say it ain't so. Yes, it is. This is America, 2023. This is the uh, wisest man who ever lived talking. This is Proverbs. We love it, and except for this scripture. We're like, eh, just move on. We like the parts where it's like, you know, let the words be like gold and flowers and all the pretty stuff. We don't, we don't like the one where it talks about how we have to actually physically do something to cause discipline to our children. Because then that makes us hurt. It makes them hurt. Everybody's crying. It's emotional. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Oh, I'm going to die. Uh, we've all had them. 
Well, not all, but most of us have had them. And we're still here. I guess I should correct that. The ones that haven't had them, some of them are not here. But it's very hard to do it, I admit it. But this is an example of a punishment consequence, whatever word you want to use, you use a spiritual word all you want to. But y'all, church family, it's still biblical for people that are young and don't know any better to have a consequence for their bad actions. And look, if your child is 19 and still living at home, I don't care how old they are, they still act like they're 15. You might want to still treat them like they're 15. I don't care. There's not an age where you get to talk back. There's not an age where you get to do what you want. I, you know, I've seen so many poor parents abused these days because you've let the devil tell you that you can't be the discipline of your home. I don't care how old your adult kids are. If they lean on you for anything, you need to cut them off if they're going to keep all that mess up because all you're doing is enabling them and the devil's telling you it's because, it's because of you they'll be lost. That's a lie. Well, if I don't do this for them, they might commit suicide. It's a lie. Stop all that mess. Stand for what's right. Tell them, I, look them in the eye and say, I love you. This is not allowed. Why, Dad? I love you. Why, Mom? I love you. They're going to tell you you don't love them. That's what they're going to say. And when they do that, you say, Proverbs 13, 24, he who spares his rod hates his son. I love you. Argue with God. He who loves him disciplines him promptly. Number two, elders in the church, God forbid, elders do everything perfect. 1 Timothy 5 and 16, 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. We don't just hear stuff, gossip, and believe it. Amen? Because if someone has been proven to be tried and true, you don't easily just, just get rid of them. It takes a lot to prove that someone who's been around a long time, that's done it right a long time, is messing up. So you don't just hear someone's gossip about an elder and believe it. You make sure there were two or three witnesses to the thing that you're complaining about. Valid witnesses. But in the case that something has to be dealt with, watch this, 1 Timothy 5 and 20, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may also fear. Now, in our culture today, we would call this, that's embarrassing and that could give them emotional abuse. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Snowflake generation. People melt easily under the pressure and intensity of truth. But... He said, "If you, now watch this, watch the context here. We're talking about elders, those who know better the most. Look, the higher you go up in the kingdom, the more consequences there are. Do y'all believe in that? You believe there should be more consequences for someone who's been taught for 30 years about how to do something right over someone that just got started? Yes. And the reason why it says this is because the elders have a higher standard of living. And they're supposed to live right more than anybody. And when you find an elder that's not right and it's actually true, rebuke them before all so all the other elders can take note and say, this ain't going to fly in the kingdom of God. So, so I know I just got on to y'all about how you take care of your kids, but guess what? This is for all of us today. From the babies to the elders. Now, I'm not just picking on parents today on how to take care of your children. This is a concept missing in the kingdom. This is, it's all of us struggle with this. I as a pastor struggle. I struggle with this. You're struggling with this. This is hard for us to do, y'all, because it's hard for us to stand up and be strong. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to rebuke an elder before all? Is it in the Bible? Now, does this mean like the whole church? Not necessarily. Could it mean just among the elders? Probably. But the point is this, if something has happened and it's big and it's, and it's out there and massive, it should be dealt with and not just hidden under the rug. 
And if anybody's going to have to to expose something, it should be those who are in leadership. Not those who just came into church their first service and they're still smoking cigarettes. Oh no, I caught him, Pastor. He's been here two weeks, but he's still got that old devil of smoke inside of him. I'm not worried about the brother that just came in for two weeks smoking a cigarette. That's the least of my concerns. I'm worried about the guy on the leadership team don't get his attitude right. I'm worried about the elder who's had the Holy Ghost for 30 years that knows better, still treating people rude. You know the people I've had the hardest time with? We've even had some of them leave our church. People in leadership. You know why? Because I'm harder on people in leadership than I am new people. That's the Jesus principle. I got new converts, people that are new to our church, uh, been here for a few years, like Sister Diane, who's been coming for a few years. We love her very much. And she, they write, this family writes these big letters about how, what a great pastor I am. And yet we've had leaders that think I'm horrible. <laughs> Do you know why we've had leaders that have thought I'm horrible? Because I'm actually telling the leader, you've got to get right if you're going to be a leader. I'm not telling Diane that. I'm not telling new people that. You know why? Because they have not been here long enough. They're not in leadership. But I expect more from you who have had the Holy Ghost for 30 years. I expect more from you that are in leadership on this platform teaching people you are going to be held to a higher standard than anybody else. And I will not allow that to happen in this church. Pastor, should you ever get on to anybody? Well, well, yes, but here's my pecking order. Those who've been given the most responsibility. And we'll work our way down from there. Jesus said, Jesus said, I don't want to offend any of these little ones, but you you religious people, come here. Some of your kids know better, treat them differently. Some people in the church know better, treat them differently. Some people had lots of time. We got to deal with this stuff, y'all. Let me hurry today. Church members. Let me paraphrase, paraphrase 1 Corinthians 5, the whole chapter here. I don't have time for it all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there, there was this man. And this man was a member of the church. And the Bible says that he was getting kissy with his mother-in-law. And you're not supposed to get kissy with mother-in-law, young people. I think you probably know that. And it's probably making you kind of gag a little in your mouth right now just thinking about it. But... That's good. It ought to be that way. The problem in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, church family, is that the church wasn't upset about it. Paul heard that the church had done nothing. This was happening, and no one did anything in the church. You know, because we don't want to offend anybody. So because we don't want to offend anybody, we'll let adultery take place among us from our core membership. Because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Because if we say something, they might be lost. I got a newsflash for you. They're already lost. They're extra lost. Because anybody that can roll up in here and worship God and be in adultery at the same time is extra lost. Anybody that can come in here and be like, I'm going to dance a jig and lift my hands and be committing adultery with your mother-in-law, you are extra lost. You are extra lost. You're already lost. You need someone to step up and say something, intervene, and deal with it. You don't need the church to turn a blind eye. You need us to fix this. So Paul said, here's what you're going to do. He said, I want you to get this thing straightened up. This man ain't repenting and getting right, so I'm going to pray and turn him over to the devil for the destruction of his flesh, his skin, his body, so that his soul could be saved. What I'm about to pray is not to damn him. What I'm about to pray is not to hurt him. What I'm about to pray is not to destroy him. He's already destroyed. What I'm about to pray is going to save his soul. What I'm about to do is going to be the best thing that could ever happen to that man. He needs to wake up. He's deceived. He's perverted. He needs a word from God. But more than that, he needs the church to agree. Why did Paul not do it himself? Because it doesn't do any good if one man wants it done and the whole church disagrees. Everybody has to be on the same team here. Because what's going to happen is whenever that man finds out that he's being kicked out of the assembly, 
he's going to go run to about four or five of you saints and say what a bad pastor he is because he's kicking you out of the church and you've done nothing wrong. Because you're not the one knowing the truth about the adultery. You're not the one hearing from God in the spirit. It's not your job to. So you get to hear how bad Paul is. How mean Paul is. How Paul doesn't love people. How Paul doesn't have a love for people. I'm getting kicked out of the church. And there's a few saints always that say, Pastor, but what if he doesn't live for God whenever he leaves the church? He's already not living for God, church family. We're living in a day now where people don't get kicked out of a church assembly and have to go have their flesh denied because they'll just go to the church down the road and start fresh. And guess what? The pastor down the road doesn't know everything I know about the saint. And before you know it, two months later, they're up there preaching in their pulpit. And I'm sitting here scratching my head going, you don't realize what they just did in my church two months ago. Because we don't agree as a church in the city like they did back in the day. God help us, pray for us. We need to unify in the last days. But what happens is people can live in sin and transfer churches and they can go start fresh there and be deceitful again there and keep living the same sin they had here. But that's the beauty of getting called out and staying because we can have accountability over you to see that you've recovered from your sins. Now, I can't stop it and I won't because if people want to leave, they need to leave. They're going to cause more problems if they stay. But it's sad that people would get called out and leave. It's sad that people would not check back in with the status of how they're doing. It's sad that people would get called out and say, I'm going to go start fresh down the road and be on their leadership team. You're missing the whole point of what God's trying to do. God is trying to get you to fix what's broken in you and get called out for it so that you can be saved because he loves you. Hebrews 12 and 5, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he corrects, he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For with son is there there whom a father does not chasten. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten, does not correct? But if you are without correction and chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. The King James Version says you're a bastard. There are people in every church that do not feel love because they have no correction. There are people in every family and children that don't feel love because there is no loving correction. Some kids are dying for correction. They're thirsty for it. They hate all the out of controlness. And our Father, our loving Father, is telling us that He loves us when He corrects us. Are we allowed to punish others? No. That's the answer. We don't punish people. But we are allowed to discipline our children, verbally speak against unrepenting ungodliness, remove people from leadership positions or even membership in the church and turn them over to the devil if it means saving their soul. And we can even not keep the company of those who do sin and won't repent. For our Bible tells us, and Paul said, he said, if there's a brother that's a drunkard that calls himself a brother that won't repent and won't get right, stop hanging out with him, stop eating dinner with him, because anybody who calls himself a brother doesn't live like a brother, you've got to get far away from him. Pastor, I just don't know why anybody wants to hang out with me anymore. It's because you're the drunkard that calls himself a brother, and it's awkward. Maybe it's not drinking. Maybe it's something else. Maybe there's something else you're battling with and people don't know how to tell you because it's awkward. So you know what they've finally done? They've said, I can't talk to you. You won't listen to me. You're difficult to talk to. I'm done. I'm not hanging out with you anymore. And do you know why there's divides in a church? I'm done. Let me just wrap it up. You know why there's divides in a church? Because we can't talk to each other about things. So you know what we do? We say, good, good to see you, brother. Good to see you. See you later. I don't want no trouble. Name 10 people you can go up to right now and tell them. If you caught them in sin, you could talk to them about it. Name 10 people in your mind. Could you, who'd you could go up to in this church, walk up to them and say, I know you've been in sin and I want to talk to you about it without being fearful of them getting mad or leaving the church. It's hard to do, isn't it? Do you know why it's so hard to do, church? Because we don't understand that there are difficult consequences to what we do wrong. But we don't punish people 
We don't hurt people, but there are consequences. And we do everything we do because we love God and we love people enough to suffer for them. And we hate it. It's awkward. I hate it. I know you do too. So lastly, my last question before we close tonight, what is the power of the church? We are a unified vocal agreement. We have a unified vocal agreement to stand up against anything ungodly among us with love for people. We don't do it because we get power trips. We do it because we love people. You have to love. You have to love. You have to love. But we also have to speak up. And there will be awkward consequences to things that happen. It's going to happen. You know the reason why I've been talking about loving Austin and preaching about love and loving, loving, loving. You know why that's so important? Because the reason we can't talk to each other is because we don't love each other. Well, I, I kind of can tell who I can get on to and who I can't. If I feel like I have not showed that I've loved somebody, I'm a lot more skittish on talking to them about what they're doing wrong. You all notice that too? But man, the closer I am to people, the easier it is to say, hey, I need to tell you something. Something you've been doing that it's not godly. So tonight, I am not telling you to go around and start being church police. I'm not telling you to go home and kick everybody out of your house because they didn't make their bed. Let's don't go to extremes tonight. I'm telling you, as a Christian, do we have to sit there and take it and brush it under the rug? No, we don't. The Christians need to be more vocal. We need to stand up for what's right. And we need to be willing to suffer for truth. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody. But y'all, we do not turn blind eyes to things. Especially among the house of God. I didn't even have time tonight to go through all the scriptures about it, but, but Paul said we judge in the house. We don't judge without. We don't judge the sinners in the world. We have no jurisdiction there, but we have authority right here in this place. If you're a brother and you're a sister, you have opened yourself up to the consequences. You have, and there's no such thing as getting away with things. We're going to suffer. So I hope that helps you tonight with what do we do when stuff's going crazy? Do we just ignore it? Let it happen? No. Y'all, let's bring back loving discipline into our lives. Let's bring back words to each other face to face without anger and wrath. Let's bring back dinners with each other, sitting down with the Bible open saying, hey, I felt something and I want to share it with you. Let's stop being afraid of each other. If they're truly a brother, you cannot run them off. Let me tell you something. You, you'll never run anybody off that's really in the kingdom. Because they'll never leave over you. They love God too much. People that love God too much will never leave this church because of you. Never. Praise the Lord. Y'all all right? That was a long lesson. That was a lot of information, but I just wanted to share with you, we are not weak people. We're loving people, and the love of God in us gives us the right to be vocal, to stand up and make decisions. And I'm telling you, as we go forward, there's going to be times when if you're in leadership, if you're on the platform, if you're teaching, if you're wanting to be in ministry, I will deal with you differently than anyone else in the church. Please do not be offended. I know that you can go down the road and work at someone else's ministry team. It might be looser there. But here, this is too important to me. This is too valuable to us. We've got too many broken people that need us on our A game. And it is a high honor to be a saint of God, a minister of God. And the way we live and the way we act, it matters and I'm telling you, if you can take it, God will elevate your ministry so fast, so quick, that God will use you faster than you can realize. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's all stand for a minute. Clap our hands to the Lord. Give God praise.